Good morning, Kingsland Baptist Church. We are so glad each and every one of you are here today to worship. You are in for a treat. I hope that when you came in that you were given one of these beautiful little uh, bulletins that have all kind of information about Kingsland and a little communication card for you. You may be visiting with us today. If you are, thank you. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. We've been all over the community to a little something we call Operation Chesterfield, doing service projects and praying for the community and reaching out all over, uh, all over the neighborhoods in the area. And if you were one of the ones that were invited to that, thank you for coming. Thank you one and all, all of our guests. There's an opportunity for you to give us a little information there. You can drop this in the offering plate when it comes by later. Or if you want to, just hand it to me after church. Just hand it right to me and I'll take it. And also in the, in the bulletin is a lot of information right in the middle that all the preschool and children and youth and adult and senior adult programs that we have at Kingsland. This isn't everything, but it's an awful lot. And you can check out more at kingslandbaptist.com. Today, we are culminating. This is kind of the culmination of a month of awesome ministry through Operation Chesterfield. We've been doing so many different things, inviting so many folks. We had our block party yesterday. Kingsland folks that, that served yesterday, we had 92 people serving in the block party from Kingsland. Thank you. Thank you for getting out there in the sun. Some of us didn't put the suntan lotion on like we should have on our faces, and uh, there you go. But um, I highly recommend a hat or sunglasses or some suntan lotion next year, but we'll, we'll make a note to do that. But uh, it was a great day. Light sang at the, at the block party yesterday, so some of you all heard them for the first time there. They're from Liberty University. Make sure you check out their table, and I forgot to tell the last people about this, but check out the table in the back. You can pick up some of their CDs and stuff on your way out today. Very, very high-quality Christian music. I hope that you came today ready to worship the Lord, ready to receive a blessing with an open heart to what God wants to do in your life. Would you pray with me? Would you stand with me? And let's pray together. God in heaven, we stand in your presence asking for you to pour yourself out on us. We want to know you just a little bit more. We want to worship you more passionately. We want to serve you with a little more dedication. Lord, we just want to get to know you better today. I pray, dear God, that our relationship with you would be closer on this Easter Sunday, realizing that's what Easter's all about, is restoring broken relationships with you and also with other people. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of, a day of peace, a day of reconciliation, a day of relationship, that we would celebrate our relationship with you, that we would go deeper in it, and that we would mend broken relationships in our lives. Lord, I pray for the one who's sick that you'd heal that person. I pray for the one that's lost that you'd save him or her. I pray for the one that's wandering away, Lord, that today you would lovingly wrap your arms around her or him and bring them back to yourself. We praise your holy name and thank you. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for raising from the, de the dead. And thank you for this day each year where we celebrate that. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Light, for reminding us of Christ's blood shed on that cross to wash away our sins, to give us relationship. That's what Easter is all about, restoring relationships. Sin breaks relationships. Jesus heals relationships. Turn over to Genesis 3, if you would. And we're going to look at it. This, this ancient, I mean, one of the, just about the oldest prophetic passage in all of Scripture that, that warned us or, or predicted or, or helped us know that Easter was coming, Resurrection Sunday. It's not, it won't jump at the page at first, but you'll see it. You know, Hollywood has finally caught up with Easter. They've always had these Christmas feel-good movies that had nothing to do with Jesus. And now um, we, we got to see this, uh, this movie the other night at the drive-in. That was, it was cute, it was fun, and it's all about Easter and everything that really Easter is nothing about. A bunch of bunnies and, and uh, chocolate candy and all those jelly beans and all this kind of thing. And what we're seeing is that our world is becoming more and more secular. Uh, people in America are growing up, and, and there's some people who have never heard of Jesus, never heard of the resurrection, or think of it as kind of a myth. Well, we know that it's much more than, than that. We know it's, it's history. 500 people saw Jesus after he rose from the grave. 500 people. His, his apostles died. Each one of them died for their faith in Christ. A man that they saw live, they saw bleed and suffer on a cross and on, on Easter morning, raised from the dead. Do you really think that all those men would have died for a lie? Are you kidding? No way. Plenty of archaeological, plenty of rational, plenty of logical reasons to believe in the resurrection. That's why we're here today on Easter Sunday. 
But sadly, George Barna's released his most uh, current poll numbers on, on some subjects. The subject of universalism has come up a lot. Do you know what universalism is? Brief, briefly defined, universalism is the belief that all human beings will be saved after death. In other words, all dogs go to heaven. Everybody dies, everybody goes to heaven, doesn't matter what you did, and whatever religion or anything like that. And um, his statistics say about 40% of those polled believe that. 40% of people polled believe that uh, regardless of how you lived your life, regardless of whether or not you had a relationship with Christ, regardless of what religion you were or what, anything like that, everybody goes to heaven. 40% of the American public believes that. Now then, the flip side of that is another, another uh, here, here's a statement that, that, that half the people agreed with, or almost half the people. All people, um, okay, excuse me, if a person is generally good or does enough good things for others, they will earn a place in heaven. 48% of the people agreed with that. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you can never be good enough to earn a place in heaven. But half the American public believes that um, you can be good enough, or if you're good or do enough good things, you can earn a place in heaven. And then it's uh, kind of a generational question, more towards, geared towards the younger folks. Across all adults, including Christians and other faith groups, young Americans, age 18 to 39, so this is a cross-section, this is just Christians, this is all kinds of people they were surveying, 18 to 39 were considerably less likely than older Americans to believe that in life, you either side with God or side with the devil. There is no in-between. Similarly, young people were less enamored with the idea of telling others about their religious beliefs. So young people across the board are not very um, excited about pushing their faith on others. And they don't necessarily believe that you have to side between God and the devil. Some of them don't believe in either. Many of them don't believe in either. Many of them have never been taught to believe in either. So that, that's on Resurrection Sunday morning, that's a place to gauge where our, our society is, where people that we see up and down the street, at the mall, at the park, whatever, that's how they think. I think that's very true of people in our community. Many people in our community just believe, well, you live, you die, you go to heaven. Most people believe in God. Most people believe in heaven. They don't want to talk about hell. They don't want to believe in that. And they don't, you know, how bad would you have to have to be to do that? Well, what we find all the way at the beginning of the Bible is a, an individual, a naive individual, a sweet, beautiful, trusting, innocent individual who is deceived greatly. Do you remember the story in Genesis chapter 3? Eve was deceived by the serpent. And that's what we're going to read in Genesis chapter 3. And, 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 the, and of course she ate the fruit, you remember that. And then Adam ate the fruit. And... They sinned, and they lost their relationship. They lost their fellowship. Their fellowship with God was broken. Their relationship with God, everything was perfect and sinful and peaceful and no problem. Now they have sinned. Now they've been broken. Now they're going to die. And here is what God says to the serpent, the snake, and to Eve immediately after. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, Then God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed more than any livestock. And more than any wild animal, you will move on your belly and, and eat the dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed, your descendants, and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Did you catch it? That's prophetic. That's, um, I don't know, 4,000 years before Christ. But it says, Eve's seed, he will strike your head. Who is Eve's seed? That's Jesus, her descendant. And he and you will strike his heel. Satan struck and gave Jesus a death blow, a temporary death blow, but Christ crushed his skull, giving him a permanent death blow. Easter is all about restoring relationships. And we see from the very beginning that that restoration plan was put into place. From the very beginning of time, uh, man, mankind sinned, mankind's relationship was broken with God, and a plan to, to have restoration was put in place through Christ, through Eve's great, 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 great grandson. It's amazing how bad you can pay for just one mistake. You don't, you don't watch the street when you're crossing the street. You could pay dearly. You don't pay attention with electricity. You could pay dearly. It's amazing how one person's sin. You know, if you're an alcoholic, your, your alcoholism affects your whole family. If you're a violent person, if you're abusive, it affects everybody. If you're a drug addict, if you're, it, it, you know, it's impossible to live life in a vacuum. 
what we do affects others. And it could be the simplest mistake. It could be the smallest lapse of judgment, and it could cost you everything. When I was a boy in our community, there was a, a young girl, a little bit older than me at the time, in the, in the mid-1980s, who her parents were moving away. And she didn't want to move away. She's 14. She liked where she was. She liked her youth group and all that kind of stuff. And good kid, just rebellious and didn't want to, didn't want to move. And um, so she snuck out. She had one of her father's employees pick her up and drive her to her boyfriend's house to see him one more time before they moved. And he did. That guy did. And then he picked her up. And, and instead of driving her home, this evil human being, this man, abused that girl. And he took her life. Her name was Trisha Stevens. It breaks my heart because I was trying to do research on her this week. And you know what? I couldn't find anything on the web. I couldn't find anything. I had to... Facebook some old friends that knew about her to, to remind me of the story. I was so young. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. There's hardly any re- remembrance even of her. She's been gone for 20-something years because she made one simple mistake. I mean, just a, a lapse of judgment, a sin. And it cost her so much. And it cost those around her so much. And you see, when Eve took that fruit, when Adam took it, it cost them so much. God is love, and we've sung saying about His mercy and His healing and His forgiveness, how great He is. Listen, God loves you, but He's just as just and holy as He is loving. He loves you. He loves you so much He died for you, and He rose from the grave. That's what we're celebrating today. But, but His holiness and His wrath will be satisfied. There's no way we can have relationship and fellowship and intimacy with God when we have sin in our lives, blocking that off. Even those of us that are born again, that are Christians, that maybe have walked away. You know, you walk and you, you don't realize that you've gone that far. Next thing you know, you're farther down the path than you thought, and God seems so far away. Thank God, man, all you got to do is turn around and He's right there. He'll never turn His back on you. But sin blocks our fellowship, right? It gets in our way. And we need to restore that relationship. Someone's come this morning today on Easter Sunday. It's the first time you've been in church in a long time. You need to get your relationship with Christ strong again. Some, some might be here and you don't even have a relationship with Christ. You're not yet saved. Man. Listen, you might want to be a good dad or a good kid or a good teacher or whatever you do for a living. Or, listen, you can't do it on your own. You're never going to be good enough. You need a relationship with Christ. You need the Holy Spirit to come in your life and save you and make you new. And that's really the promise that was made here all the way back to Eve. The results of the fall. Let's look at it back at verse 15. I will put hostility between you and the woman. Do you see that? The result of the fall, number one, strife between Satan and Eve, or Eve's really rep- representing humanity. Whoever you are, make no mistake about it, Satan hates your guts. He wants to destroy you. He's not your friend. Some of you might be fooling around with like paganism or Satanism or Ouija boards or whatever. Listen, he hates your guts. He's powerful. He's nowhere near as powerful as God, but he's dark and he's, and he, and he's wicked and He wants to bring you down. Sin ruins relationship. Sin breaks fellowship and relationship. Jesus heals relationships. So this sin brought strife between Satan and humanity. Why do we have war? Why do we have crime? Why did, how did a good God ever allow crime and war to come into our world? You know what? It wasn't His idea. Sin. It's wickedness. And it began with this, this rebellion. Another result of the fall. Strife between Satan and Jesus. It says, I will put hostility between you and and the woman, talking to Satan, the serpent, and between your seed and her seed. Now we're talking about Jesus, or all of her seed, all of humanity, but all the way down to Jesus specifically. He hates Jesus. He was so happy to see Jesus on that cross. And and that brings us to the, the third result of the fall, and that is the ultimate defeat of Satan. It says that he, Jesus, will strike your head. That's a death blow. That's a mortal blow to the head, and you will strike his heel. That's the fourth result of the fall, temporary, a temporary defeat of Jesus. The serpent, in a sense, struck his heel. It wounded him. It looked like all hope was gone. Jesus was dead. Imagine being one of the disciples there looking at your Savior on the cross, bleeding. He healed people. He rose Lazarus from the dead. He, did a, he just a week earlier had come in in the triumphal entry with hundreds of thousands of people cheering for him, and now he's dead? How could that be? It was a temporary defeat. You may be dealing with some defeat in your life right now. Understand, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, 
Whatever defeat you're dealing with, it is temporary. It's going to come. It's going to go. You're going to live in paradise. You're going to live in heaven. You're going to be worshiping the King of Kings at His feet for all eternity. And an awesome praise band like this. It might be in Hebrew. I don't know. But we will be praising God and, and worshiping the Lord forever and ever. We, we, listen, whatever, whatever's wrong in your life, as bad as it may be, as bad as you might be hurting, it's temporary. It's temporary. So that empty tomb reminds us that Jesus' defeat was temporary. God can take dead things and make them live. Think about that. God can take dying things and bring them to life. You may be sick. You may be emotionally hurting. You may be physically not well. God can heal you. He may not choose to physically heal you, but He may. He may. You may want to come forward today and we'll pray for you to receive physical healing. He can do that. He can choose to heal you. He can choose not to heal you. We don't understand His plan all the time, do we? God takes dead things and makes them alive. God takes dying things and brings life in them. You may have a relationship that is dying and it breaks your heart. Listen, God can breathe life into that. You may have a marriage that's dying. And boy, you'd be embarrassed if anybody knew it, but you and your spouse know it. Your marriage is dead and you need life. Listen, on Easter Sunday, what better day to remember God brings life where things are dead or dying. Ask Him to bring life back into your marriage. Maybe you have a relationship with a child that's just broken and and it's bad and you want it to be restored. Maybe you have a brother or sister in this room that you can't talk to. Man, that's wrong. Don't let that be that way. Let Christ bring life. Listen, if you name the name of Christ, if you say you're a Christian, that means you've been forgiven. That means you've received Christ's forgiveness in your life. You have no right, no right whatsoever to withhold forgiveness to anybody else, no matter how terrible what they've done to you is. Reconciliation is the only answer. It's the only answer. And that's why Christ came, to restore broken relationships. That's why he's, he's alive, he, and we can have a relationship with him, and we can have a relationship with one another. I want to share one last verse with you and, um, from Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 tells us a little bit more about the sin that, that mankind committed. It says, therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, Adam and Eve, the mankind, and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all men, because all of sin. That means we're condemned. That means Adam and Eve, our great-great-great-grandparents did it. We were born with it. We were born walking away from God. We were born contaminated with sin. Thank God, just a few verses earlier in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. Make no mistake about it, folks. Wrath is real. God's judgment is real. And, and, and we can be saved from that. He loves us so much, He died for us so that we wouldn't have to endure that. At the same time, be warned. You can choose that. You can choose rebellion. You can choose religion. You can choose your own good works. You can choose whatever you want that will end in that direction, the direction of wrath and judgment and separation from Christ forever. The good news is really good because you don't have to have that. You don't have to settle for that. Jesus Christ died so that you could live. In the same way that Eve and Adam sinned and death passed upon you, through one man's death and resurrection, you can have life. A lot of people died on crosses, ladies and gentlemen. That's not that unique. Only one perfect, spotless, virgin-born Son of God died on a cross. He did it for you. He did it for me so that we could have our relationship restored with Him and with one another. And the good news is we come to a close today. Whatever relationship in your life is hurting, and you should scan through your mind. How am I doing with my kids? How am I doing with my spouse? How am I doing with those people around me? How am I doing with the guys at work? The relationships in your life at church, He can bring healing. He can bring life into dead marriages, dead job situations. And most of all, most importantly, He can bring eternal life into your heart today if you'll ask for it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Let, we're we're going to close. We'll sing another song. And um, this is a time of invitation and, and for introspection. Would you look in your heart? Thousands of years before Christ was even born, God the Father promised that He would come and destroy Satan, give him a, a death blow to the, to the head. And He had to have His heel bruised. He had that temporary setback. 
All the sin of humanity was laid on Him. He died and He suffered for my sins and yours so that you don't have to suffer for them. I wonder this morning if you want to give your heart to Jesus. I'm not asking if you want to join our church or become a Baptist or sign something or anything like that. Do you want to have eternal life? Do you want to have, it said you can be declared righteous. Did you notice that in Romans 5? To be declared righteous, be made righteous. Not because you're a good person, but because you've been forgiven. Because the blood of Jesus has been applied to your heart. If you're going to give your heart to Jesus today, I want to pray with you and lead you in a prayer where you can do that. Christians, we should be leading by example. During this altar call, if you want to come forward and pray for your family or pray for your job situation or, or, or your relationship with Christ, if you've given your heart to Christ recently and you want to be baptized, come forward and request it. We'll baptize you. If you want someone to pray with you, we'll have folks here to pray with you. If there's a relationship in your life that's broken, as a Christian, you should be very, very convicted, and I bet you are. Why don't you ask God to bring life, to, to breathe life into that dead relationship, that dying relationship? If you need physical healing, why don't you ask God, oh God, breathe life into me. I, don't, I, I need your healing more than I need a doctor's pill or anything like that. He can heal you. Ask him for it. Today, if your problem is that you've never yet started a relationship with Christ, I want to lead you through a prayer right now, give you an opportunity to pray, to invite Christ into your life. It's not really so much of a prayer as it is a decision, an act of the will, to give your life over to Him, to quit trying to be good enough, to quit trying to earn your way to heaven, or to quit doing whatever it is you're doing that's breaking your fellowship with God, your relationship with God. We call it sin. To turn your back on your sin and to cry out to God for mercy. If you feel something in your heart kind of percolating, that's the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart's door. He wants into your life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open up their heart, I will enter in. The Holy Spirit will come into your heart right now if you'll invite Him in. You can pray whatever you want to pray. I mean, it's not some magical potion that I'm giving here. But I'll give you some words that you can put into your own, your own terminology with God as we pray. Pray something like this. Oh, God, I need you. And you don't have to pray out loud. Just, God hears your heart. Oh, God, I need you. Jesus, I want you to come into my life right now. I'm so sorry for my sin. I turn away from my sin. Man, you might want to list them. Adultery, hate, lust, lying, stealing, cursing, abuse. Oh, God, forgive me for my sins. Please forgive me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart right now and save me. Come into my life and be my master. Be my savior. I give my life to you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want you to think about that. Did you pray that prayer? Did you just invite Christ into your life? With nobody looking, I don't want to embarrass anybody or anything like that. It's not what this is about. If you just prayed and invited Christ in your life, that's the best decision you could ever make. As a very small first step, as a testimony between you and me and Jesus, would you raise your hand? If you just prayed and invited Christ in your life and you were very serious about it, would you raise your hand where I can see it? Man, fantastic. That's great, brother. Who else? Anybody in the balcony? Let me see your hand. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. Oh, yes, sir, in the back, up front. Anybody else? I see you, sweetheart. Good job. Listen, I want to encourage you, those of you that have just given your heart to Christ to tell somebody about it. Tell the person that invited you to church today. If you have a church home, wherever you're from, tell your pastor. If you don't have a pastor, if you don't have a church, we'd love to be your church. You can come forward today and you can make your public profession of faith and you can request baptism. Don't let it die here. Let this be a beginning. This is just a very first step for you in your walk with Christ. He wants to know you. He wants you to know Him, to read His Word, to talk to Him every day. We can help you with that. If you've given your heart to Christ today and want to publicly profess that, come forward during the invitation. If there's anything we can pray with you about, if you want to join our church, come forward and you can request that. If you want to request baptism, come forward now. God, I pray that you would move powerfully during our time of invitation as we sing. Continue to draw men and women and boys and girls to Christ.
have your perfect will in our lives. Thank you for the cross. It's everything. It means everything to us. And thank you for that empty tomb. God, I pray that you'd have your will and your way in this time of invitation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing? You don't, you don't, don't put it off. Don't wait. Come as God leads you.